go on to item nine, which is a report on a recent arrest. Mr. Fells, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item is a, at the request of Council Member Whitaker, uh, Gen item review of recent arrest, and uh, just ask Chief Hughes to start us off with uh, the overview of the facts uh, involving this, and uh, uh, return it back to uh, you and uh, to, to pleasure of the Council. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, members of Council, Dan Hughes, your police chief. Uh, as I spoke to uh, Mr. Whitaker last night, uh, I will not be talking about the elements of the case or the arrest uh, because they're on they are ongoing uh, criminal uh, case pending however I will uh, provide an overview of what I believe mr. Whitaker has asked for uh, on January 18th we, there was a protest in our city at, uh, about four hours later that turned into and was declared as an unlawful assembly there were ten individuals who were arrested for failure to disperse three other Individuals were arrested for vandalism of public and private property. One was also in possession of a wrist rocket, uh, slingshot, and marbles. One was arrested for an assault, and one was arrested for a robbery uh, not related to the protest, but they were a protester who uh, uh, committed a robbery at one of our local grocery stores afterwards. The actions of these individuals and others were documented, and the documentation was forwarded to the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office filed charges on all of these individuals, as well as one more based upon the review of their conduct, which was mostly captured on video and tape recordings. The remaining suspect, which was Mr. Uh, Alan Redke, who had ran several times from the police on the 18th, was not arrested on the 18th and therefore that case was submitted to the district attorney's office and they reviewed that conduct. On March 20th, Superior Court Judge Donald Gaffney issued an arrest warrant for Mr. Redke uh, in the amount of $7,500. The detective assigned to that case made efforts to locate and arrest Mr. Redke locally and he was unable to locate him. We also re received information that Mr. Redke was aware that he had an arrest warrant but he was not going to turn himself in. On May 7th, the handling detective learned that Mr. Redke would be in the city of Pasadena. The detective contacted our directed enforcement team, which in part of their responsibility is to uh, assist detectives with open cases where there are outstanding warrants for people. Two supervisors and four detectives went to Pasadena. They followed their protocol by notifying the the Pasadena Police Department that they, we would be in their city and what we were doing. And then they contacted and arrested, arrested Mr. Redke for the warrant he had for his arrest. There were no issues with the arrest and the detectives were in Pasadena for about 15 minutes. Uh, I believe Councilmember Whitaker had asked me if it was a normal practice to make arrests for misdemeanors outside the city. And that answer is simple. Yes, it is. I think it's important for our community to know that if they are a victim of a crime in our community, whether it is a felony or it is a misdemeanor, and the suspect is known and a warrant has been issued for that person's arrest, it is going to be our obligation to attempt to locate and arrest that person, and we will vigorously pursue all leads to arrest that person. We are also mandated by a case decision called Cerna versus Superior Court which is a decision to, that mandates police departments and police officers to execute arrest warrants in a timely manner. Usually we have to fill out some type of documentation for the court if that arrest warrant is not uh, completed within the year. I also spoke to several Orange County police chiefs just to inquire if our practice here at the Fulton Police Department differed at all regarding going to other jurisdictions to make arrests on open cases, including misdemeanors. And it was unanimous, unanimous that this practice is the same as their practice. It's something that is just part of the role of policing. I also did some analysis on arrests that were made outside the city by our, our police department in the past five years. That, that, those arrests from the outside of the police department have included 631 felony arrests and 635 misdemeanor arrests outside our city borders. Um, they will answer any other questions you would have regarding that. Okay, uh, council members, do we have any questions of Chief Hughes? Uh, 
Mr. Whitaker. I should probably wait to hear from the public, but I guess my, my core question, uh, Chief, is, um, oh, in fact, let me step back. The reason this was agendized was uh, several days before our last council meeting, I was aware that there were concerns about, uh, more fiscal related concerns about the use of six officers on, on such a long transit to pick up a misdemeanor arrest. And I made inquiries internally about that, and I was asking if I could, if I could hear, you know, the reasoning behind such. And I didn't really receive any answers prior to the last council meeting. That's why I agendized the item. Uh, so I have yet to be briefed on this item, and as Chief Hughes and I spoke just last night, apparently there is documentation that he would be willing to share with me, and I, I would, will take you up on that. Uh, following this meeting, but my question to you, Chief, really is the um, that the post-incident report or study was packaged and forwarded to the district attorney, and they independently made these decisions for arrest, or were there recommendations that accompanied that? Well, well I think whenever you submit a case for filing, there are recommendations based upon. Uh, what we have witnessed. So we document that information. We, we provide a oral presentation to that as well as uh, show evidence that we believe uh, uh, shows the proof of the probable cause for the arrest. And then they make the decision whether or not they're going to file charges or not. Well, I appreciate that. And, and where I'm at on this is, is wanting to understand because we on the council get held accountable for policy decisions by the city, even though largely we leave it to you to run the police department and, and try to provide as little interference as necessary. At least I certainly, that's my goal. Um, however, in this case, the very protest that was occurring was a protest against your department and against actions of members of, of the Fullerton Police Department. And so the after-incident review and recommendations for arrest, I, it would seem to me as a policymaker uh, it could be a very loaded situation to do that. And it could appear as though uh, your, your command staff decisions might be loaded with a certain amount of animosity over the fact that, that this protest was even happening against your department or against... And so, to me, that was my concern, and that's why I felt like uh, I, I needed to get some open answers for the public. I think they're entitled to some of those. Well, well sir, and I appreciate that. I, I would just say that, you know, as, as you're aware, because you attended some of those protests that were in front of the police department for months and months and months, for probably over 10 months, there were protests in front of the police department. And there were no arrests that were made during those protests. Matter of fact, we did everything we possibly could to ensure that they had the ability to express their First Amendment rights. They, we blocked intersections. We provided uh, chairs at times. We provided water. We provided ice for uh, people who had ice chests uh, that needed, needed to cool off water. And so we had done everything possible to ensure that they could peacefully protest. And I think the difference between this one is, and what was interesting about this one, is this was an incident that those people who had protested in our city many, many members of our community were ones that we had actually built relationships with throughout those months. They were the same similar individuals who were calling us and telling us that there are going to be a large group of individuals who are coming to the city that all they want to do is disrupt your community, that they are going to Liar. commit violence against the police, they're Liar. going to try to vandalize the police department, Liar. which in fact did take place. They were going to vandalize businesses in our downtown area, Liar. which did in fact take place, and that they were trying to look for some confrontation. Liar. And so we certainly will do everything we can when it comes to uh, protest, ensure that they have a right to do so. That's part of my responsibility as a police chief, to, to allow for that. Even when people Not disagree minority report, with you can't predict my decisions, I, I fully understand that. So they have a right to protest. They can conduct themselves in a shameful manner. They can conduct themselves in a vulgar manner. That's not my issue, but they cannot conduct themselves in an unlawful manner. And so, sir, when, when we're talking about the protection of our community in the city of Fullerton, even if it has to do with the, the Fullerton Police Department, I have an obligation to ensure that our community is safe. 
And so I don't know what suggestion you would have if we're involved in it in some who would be that person who would come in and make that decision whether or not uh, action needs to be taken. But I will tell you, from my understanding of my role as the police chief in this city, it is my responsibility to ensure that this community is safe. And that's the action that I took that day. And who do you need to be safe? Please, this is the opportunity of the council to ask questions. One, one additional clarification. Um, you said that at some point the protest became an unlawful assembly. I, I wasn't there, I wasn't present that day, although I did catch a few minutes of it with the online streaming that was occurring. Um, and uh, if, from what I saw, the portions that I saw, it was, it was all peaceful. I didn't see anything that rose to the level probably of, of needing to crack down on it. But uh, how was that communicated? How, what happened? Who made the determination that this protest was now an unlawful assembly. That would help me to understand. Sure. U ultimately, I'm the one that makes that decision. And I made that decision based upon my observations, based upon the information I received from people in the field. And I, I understand you weren't there. I, I know that our mayor was there and our city manager was there. I believe uh, Councilman Seaborn was there. And uh, we also received a number of 911 calls from our community members that believed that they were being attacked. And we had roads that were being Fire. closed. We had community members who were not allowed to freely travel throughout our community. That, that, that uh, vehicles were being blocked. There were, there were cardboards that were being placed over the windows so the people could not see as they were driving. They were being blocked intersections, not allowing vehicles to go through. We would have vehicles liar. meeting in fear of their safety, the having to, to cross you, over the center barriers to go over different directions. We had businesses calling, saying that their, their um, businesses were being spray painted, that they were being uh, uh, chairs being thrown at them. All of those are pretty good One indicators, business, sir, that that's liar. not a peaceful protest. When you take over an intersection, you take barricades that were put up simply to allow the protest to have freedom to walk across our streets so they wouldn't have to wait for the street lights and they take those vandalize them move them throughout our community and block intersections that would not allow other people to freely travel so uh, based upon the totality that i believed it was unlawful assembly we documented it we took most of those videotapes that you talked about the live streams were part of the presentation the district attorney's office a number of them looked at it and they also concurred with my my, my belief that it was an unlawful assembly. Therefore, they filed charges on people who failed to disperse when they were ordered to do so. Well, well my concerns, even in bringing this forward this evening, are to de-escalate what's going on. And I, I'm only concerned that policy-wise we may be headed in the other direction, potentially. And, and so that was my concern. One final question. Uh, on an average weekday, uh, your force in the city how many officers would be outside the city at any given time? Uh, and I understand that will vary, but as a running average, just how many officers would be uh, doing operations outside of our city? I, I don't have that information for you. I will tell you that in terms of the officers who provide those services, they, they are officers who are not in a patrol function. Their function is to follow up on cases, to make arrest for people who are have arrest warrants on Fullerton cases. And so when you talk about misdemeanor cases, those misdemeanor cases involve domestic violence, assaults, sexual assaults, some burglaries, uh, vandalisms. So the misdemeanor uh, involves a number of different items. And so uh, you know, I can understand why somebody who isn't a victim of one of those things and there's a suspect that is one in that why you might not understand why there's a need to follow well, up who's on the that, victim but, of a but protest? i believe that it is our role to do that and mm -hmm. again as long as i'm your police chief we, we are going to vehemently go after people who violate the law here in the city who's the Florida. victim mr hughes all right i'll wait i'll wait for more clarification on that i as far as the deployment of officers okay, okay thanks. are there any other questions from any of the other council members Okay, hearing none, I will open this up for public comment. 